security get attracted because there's a bit of them that's breaking things. You know, and I think there's even the same with developers. Like developers probably as children pulled their toys apart to see how they worked. My name is Troy Hunt. I develop security software and I built a little website called Have I Been Pwned. I launched Have I Been Pwned in December 2013. Within weeks, it just took on a life of its own. One of the things I did very early on is just optimize as far as I possibly could. So everything from caching as much content as I possibly could through to obviously reducing the overhead on all the requests. So I had things like auto scale configured on the app server. PU goes beyond a certain amount for a certain amount of time, then I'd get another instance. I'd keep sort of add these logical units of server so it would scale, which is great. And then I had cases like the TV show in the UK, ran at prime time, have I been pwned on it? And my traffic just increased hundreds and hundreds of times over in the space of seconds. And I got smashed and I, I lost requests. I just couldn't deal with it. The thing I couldn't escape is that whilst I was constrained by auto scale and app service, and whilst I needed to see resources utilized to a certain amount more resources, I was always going to have this problem. So ultimate solution came via functions. So I've been moving a huge amount of stuff from APIs running the app service through into functions. And by running serverless, suddenly you have a scale which is not bound by any sort of logical infrastructure over the top of it. And here's sort of the secret behind Have I Been Pwned. The objective wasn't just to build a data breach notification service. The objective was to build a data breach notification service and to play with Azure. There's a few key things that I look at dashboard. So I want to see things like infrastructure performing. A lot less important because they just scale and perform beautifully regardless. But particularly on like my app service, how much of my CU am I using? Am I going to need to scale into a new instance? On my SQL Azure database, I want to know how many DTUs I'm using because if I start maxing out those DTUs, I might need to go and scale it up myself. And even for things like functions, which scale almost endlessly, I still want to see traffic. So I want to glance, is there something on have I been pwned that's just driven a massive amount of traffic to the site? See that immediately on the graph. The single best decision I made in terms of the services to use at the beginning of Have I Been Pwned was to use table storage. This is where the bulk of the guts of the data is. So there's 5.5 billion records sitting here in table storage. It's not the only storage construct I use, but I use Azure as well. And in SQL Azure, what I is things like data loads and notification users. The app service is the website. And then increasingly what I'm doing is I'm shifting stuff down into functions. And then when these functions are executed, functions are talking to a combination of SQL Azure, plus a call when you actually search for someone, that needs to go to table storage. And then the Redis cache is storing a bunch of things like a list of the breaches. One of the things I'm trying to do about optimizing Azure for uh, just massive amounts of API option is move as much traffic as I can from the origin site in Azure and push it back towards the because that keeps a lot of traffic off my origin, lets me scale more. It also means people get requests returned in a super, super fast way. So Cloudflare sits in front of all my Azure things between of the service and the actual service running in Azure. When someone loads the home page, Cloudflare normally doesn't have to go to the app service and pull it back. Cloudflare returns it from cache right to the origin. The users then go down and they say, I would now like to do a search for my email address. It's gonna go through to Cloudflare it's going to do functions, and functions is going to pull a combination of data from table storage, which is where the email address exists, and it's going to pull it from Redis in order to get a list of which is the individual has appeared in, and all the metadata around it as well. So it's amazing to look at how much open source has changed, and particularly my attitude towards open source as well. Open source almost seems to be this very empowering movement that's given everyone the ability to participate in software, either as consumers or contributors. All of the work I do in there is ASP.NET projects and Azure Function projects. There are a whole bunch of supporting projects. There are console apps and things like that, great little tasks that I run. And I do all of that in Visual Studio. But I've also been using Visual Studio Code for things like managing the template for my blog. That's been using to teach my son to learn how to build web pages because it's a great way for kids to learn as well. So one of the things that had always driven me since the mid-90s when I started building software for the web 
is it's almost this dream of I can go and build something myself, just on my spare time, and it can be something massive. It can ruins of people. It can be out there on the web and fundamentally change the way people work or the way they check their exposure data breaches, or maybe, but you can do it with just about nothing. And that still to this day totally amazes me.
particular regular expressions. So some of you may uh, remember back in 16, there was an outage at Stack Overflow, uh, where for, I don't know, it was 20 or 30 minutes, the system was down. And uh, Stack Overflow released a really nice post-mortem after the fact, uh, detailing what went wrong. And what went wrong was a regression that hadn't been fully validated for its performance characteristics, getting past a particular input that basically spiked CPU on all of the, the front end uh, tier servers. Um, so what I've done here is I've just extracted the details from that postmortem. Uh, I've got the particular regex here and the particular input they described, which was basically 20,000 characters. Uh, and in the bad case, it was 20,000 characters and in a white space. Um, and now it's uh, on .NET Framework 4.8, .NET 6, and .NET 7 using the good input. So we have two inputs here, a good input and a bad input. Now, if we look at just the good input, uh, we notice something you know, really nice. .NET 6 is about 10 times faster than .NET Framework. .NET 7 is about, what, 15% faster than uh, .NET 6. Yay, you know, we're making forward progress. Uh, now we try the bad input, uh, and the good news uh, is .NET 6 is still about four or five times faster than .NET Framework 4.8, and .NET 7 is more than 2x faster than .NET 6. Woohoo! Uh, you can see the downside here, or the bad news. The bad news is all numbers are like 14,000 times worse uh, than the good input. Uh, this is a huge disparity here. And that's what this research addressed with a new option in .NET 7 that is regex option non-backtracking. Uh, this is a, uh, a fully implemented engine that's able to support most, most, not all, regular expression constructs. But if you get yourself to that subset, it has this exact same semantics as if you're using the, not, the, the regular backtracking engine. So you can switch back and forth. Um, and the important thing to, uh, two important things to note, actually. For the good input, um, it's a little bit slower than at least the .NET 6 and .NET 7 implementations. In this case, particular input is about 5x slower. So this isn't always necessarily going to give you the best performance. However, you notice that for the worst case, it is order to faster than all of the other numbers. In fact, it is exactly the same whether it's a good input or a bad input, subject to you know, minor noise. Is in, in the benchmarks. And that's the important thing with this option. You get the same semantics as with the backtracking engine, but you get consistent performance regardless of the input that's being provided. Some really exciting work in .NET 7 here. Um, another category uh, of work is sort of, you know, or of improvements is thinking about all the places that we can reuse existing functionality. As developers, we like to kind of hand roll things, but if you just take advantage of the built-in helpers for things like searching with index of every release when we make those operations faster, anyone who's relying on those operations themselves gets faster. And so we've done work in this to not only improve those primitions, but also use them in as many places as we can in our own code, such that not only your code using it gets faster, but our code using it gets faster, and then your code using those uh, indirect uses this gets faster and so on. So here's a simple example. We did some factorization of uh, index of um, for searching strings, spans. Uh, in this particular case, I've got the complete uh, stories or works for Sherlock, of Sherlock Holmes from, and I'm searching for elementary, elementary, my dear Watson. Um, and you can see in this particular case, when I search for elementary uh, in .NET 6, this was taking about a second, and on .NET 7, it's taking only about 57 microseconds. So a huge improvement there. Uh, it was a 20x um, because we're we're doing a better job of figuring out exactly what to search for and how to vectorize that search. Um, similarly for ordinal and or case, we're all doing a, a better form of vectorization now, and so this also gets about four four times faster. Um, Continuing in that theme of taking advantage of these helpers, um, any place where you're not, it's worth reconsidering, you know, are there workarounds that you've employed uh, where you'd be better off just getting rid of your workaround and back to the original thing. So here's an example of that. This comes from some, uh, real code that I've simplified down. Um, the, if I want to look to see whether a yell begins with HTTPS colon slash, I starts with ordinal ignore case because I don't care about whether it's capital HTTP or lowercase HTTP and so on. Now, uh, at some point when someone wrote this code, they benchmarked this and realized that they could do it faster if they just open coded it, if they just did it themselves. So we have, uh, you know, they're checking the length here to make sure it's at least eight characters. Then they're doing some really cool ASCII tricks, recognizing that the uppercase ASCII letters 
differ by only one bit from their corresponding lowercase letters. Uh, so if I just OR in 0x20, I can do a single comparison for each. Um, and they probably benchmark this. And in fact, when I benchmark the .NET Framework 4.8, I see indeed uh, the open code 10 times faster. Woohoo! You know, good days work. Uh, two set two, uh, but both of the numbers have actually gotten faster. The 21 nanoseconds has dropped to six nanoseconds. Still better, but, but is it worth it? Eh, maybe, depends on the use case. Now we go to .NET 7, and now not only is open coded version way more code to maintain, it's also twice slow as the built-in implementation, which the JIT now recognizing these patterns and able to generate the, the most optimal implementation it can pull version of the code anytime you're employing these kind of workarounds where you know you want to revisit them and figure out whether you'll think better everyone's thinking and anytime it gets better uh, everyone's code gets better uh, and speaking of getting better uh, another important lesson is no matter how much optimized there's always more opportunity uh, there are always new things you haven't explored. Maybe improvements elsewhere in the system that you you know you previously dismissed because they're too, too slow, but now they're actually highly optimized, and you can take significant advantage of them. Um, and a great example of that again, again comes from regular expressions. Uh, so this particular benchmark uh, isn't actually one that I came up from a, a, a an open source repo that's comparing the performance of regular expressions across a whole whole uh, bunch of uh, languages and frameworks. I just copied that expression as well as the input that, that repo is using. And I'm counting how many times uh, an email address, which expression is meant to find, occurs in this input text. And if I run this on a variety of previous releases of .NET, we can see on .NET Framework 4 point taking about a second. Uh, you go to .NET Core 3.1, it improves by about 10%. That's pretty nice. Uh, you go to .NET 6, and oh man, it gets what, about 20x faster uh, at about 49 milliseconds? And then you go to .NET 7, and it gets even orders of magnitude faster at about 620 microseconds. But then there's even more opportunity. Uh, so one of the things we've done in .NET 7 is introduce a bunch of methods onto regex for doing specific operations like counting, which is what I want to do here, uh, or enumeration without actually allocating, sort of amortized non-allocate matching with regexes, as well as be able to pass in uh, spans that I can slice or get from uh, wherever it may be. Maybe I stack allocated some memory, or maybe I got some data from native code. I no longer have to copy it into a string to search it. I can just enter directly into the regex engine. And now when I just change the code to use the simpler code, it's also faster. Uh, it got about 20 microseconds faster. You'll notice that lovely allocated column is blank. That's because there was nothing allocated uh, as operation. So there is always more opportunity. And then finally, one last category uh, to think about, and there are many more than this covered in the paper, but one more for this presentation, is being thoughtful about your defaults. And you know, we, we strive when we design APIs, when we just, uh, design language features, we try really hard to come up with good defaults, where if someone uses something, uh, they're going to get kind of really great average case average case performance out of the box we don't always get it right and i imagine you don't always get it right either we're thinking about those defaults both for new things and revisiting previous choices and an example where we re revisit a previous choice in dotnet 7 is compression and specifically with broadly compression uh broadly is a compression algorithm from google we've been shipping an engine uh a, a broadly uh stream type and broadly encoder in .NET since I believe .NET Core 2 or 2.1 around there. Um, and it had the broadly compression algorithm, like many compression algorithms, it has a knob you can turn, a dial. Uh, for this case, it goes from 0 to 11. Um, and, and on one end of the dial, you have really, really, really fast compression, but maybe not the best compression ratio. So maybe you end up with a, sl a larger output. And at the other end of the Spectrum, you have the possible file size or you know, output size it can muster, but it might take a really long, long time for it to figure out how to how to offload. Um, now we can see I, I bent uh, both size and time, particular file in this case, and we see from zero to eleven a nice sort of linear progression. <coughs> Excuse me, as the as I turned up that dial, uh, going from about two point five megabytes down to about best 
compression ratio down to about 1.7 megabytes. But we see not so nice a linear scale. In fact, towards the upper end, it starts looking extremely exponential. Now, the problem is that in uh, prior to .NET 7, we chose the default of, of 11, uh, which meant um, so smaller significantly uh, performance impacting changes adults from 11 down to something more in the middle, around four. Um, now, this does mean that uh, by, by default, your output sizes might be a bit larger. In fact, if I run a simple benchmark, uh, we can see that uh, for a particular input, the resulting output is about 20% larger than previous. Now, all you have to do is set a compression level and you can get exactly back to what it was before. So we're just changing the default. But in exchange for that 20% increase in size, we have a about a 50 or a hundred, uh, about 50, uh, 75, I don't know, I can't do math off the top of my head, somewhere between 50 and 100 <laughs> X improvement. In, and we think this is a much better use of uh, your time uh, as, when using broadly as part of your algorithm. Uh, so that was just a really, really quick tour through just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, if you have a few moments or maybe hours, I'd uh, welcome you to go, go read that, uh, the blog post on its seven performance improvement. Improvements. I'd welcome feedback. I'd love for you to actually get involved and contribute to the next incarnation of that paper by contributing pull requests to .NET 8, uh, which we've already started working on uh, and which is going to be an amazing release uh, a year from now. So uh, thank you very much. Now back to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Stephen. You blow my mind as always. I can't believe the on ongoing performance improvements we continue to see from C-sharp, and you got some great questions coming in for Twitter. I'm going to start with this one here uh, for Menham. Uh, let's dive deeper because he doesn't know we're already feeling like we're at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, <laughs> not a question, but boy, oh boy, he's not wrong. Uh, he had another question, which I thought was a little more technical here. Uh, same fellow. Aren't the, there's this, this type of loop optimization in .NET 7, which Steven's talking about, involves some logical bugs? Uh, to my knowledge, there are no cases where we introduce bugs. If there are, that would be a bug that we should fix. Yeah, I, uh, I would presume so. And you've, you, you always have a test suite for all of that, is right? Whenever you do an optimization, you match behavior exactly in the, new optim in the optimized version. Yeah, every peer we run a, a pull request, we run about 8 million tests uh, across a multitude of operating systems and and um, uh, versions of operating systems and, and so on. Um, plus then kind of not as part of PRs, but, uh, additional set on a rolling basis on a huge number of platforms. Now, there are always gaps. There's always the possibility that we'll introduce bugs, but we have a very, very large test suite in order to try to, try to choose. Some, you know, some slip through. That's why we have servicing uh, where every month we will, you know, ship uh, bug fixes for things that are either brand new in that release or maybe that have been latent for many, many years and are only just noticed. Uh, but if you do find a bug in how the JIT is compiling loops, we would love, love, love to know about it. So please shoot in, in that runtime repo. Yeah, and so GitHub's there for a purpose, right? We'll be able to put the issues in directly to you and see them directly addressed back again. Hey, I, let me give you a little more philosophical question as well, which is, you know, why didn't you optimize this stuff in the first place? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, we, we strive to optimize things in the first place. Um, in some cases, uh, there are opportunities where we just didn't notice them. Maybe we got smarter or we learned from other people. Uh, for example, the um, index of case, uh, there we're actually taking advantage of a really nice algorithm that was designed uh, by someone outside of Microsoft. Uh, that's become really popular in various frameworks and languages in recent years. We're taking advantage of, we're building on the shoulders of giants, taking advantage of somebody else up there. In other cases, we're able to build, build on our own shoulders. Work that we've done in pre improve sort of lower things or add new lower level constructs that we have elsewhere in the libraries. For example, we did a lot of work in .NET Core 3.0 and .NET 5 to add literally tens of new methods that represent uh, direct hardware instructions for doing sim. Um, and then in .NET 7, we added new Vector 128 and Vector 256 APIs for 
at a higher level for taking of all of those hardware instructions across platforms. And anytime we add those kinds of intrinsics or helpers, we can then go and you know take better and better and more and more advantage of them elsewhere in the platform, finding more and more opportunities to sort of leverage those underlying performance benefits. In other cases, it's research. I mentioned all the stuff coming from MSR or from uh, other companies or from academia. Um, there's always more more opportunity. And as much as we get it, quote, quote, right the first time, um, invariably, there's always more to do. Really appreciate your point that computer science research continues to go on. And MSR bringing you things and moving that hardware underneath you so that you now have to take advantage of it. But I get that too. I was also thinking that sometimes your customer in a way you've never thought of and it introduces a new optimization opportunity. And in fact, many of the performance improvements that come from outside things where we just weren't looking at it. Someone else had some, they were using some brand new, some code path weren't focused on. And it ended up yeah. being a bottleneck for the beauty of open source is they can come in and can fix to something we may not have touched or may not have reviewed. And they can improve it not only for themselves, but for everyone else that happens across that code path in, in .NET. Wow, I can't imagine trying to do my own optimization base. That, that's stunning to me. But I guess it's a possibility. Does it happen very often? It's actually pretty common. About uh, about twenty percent of improvements that I sort of documented in my my paper come from uh, came from outside of our team, and you know a, a lot of times it's removing an allocator or finding that some code here could have a fast path that's common, uh, or you know there are certainly some of the more intricate someone going in and actually adding an optimization to the JIT. Those are uh, more generally, uh, but there's you know a wide spectrum um, and. Uh, uh, we, we love them all. Stephen, I'm wowed as usual. Thank you so much for your contribution to .NET. I love that mic faster with each new version. And we've got to move on to the next subjects, but make sure you do your survey. Links below me here. We need that feedback to know exactly. And don't forget our great sponsors. They've put together some awesome swag bags. And if you do the secret decoder, tomorrow we'll be doing a draw. Now it's time for me to hand over to Jared Parsons talking a little bit about how language features actually get built. So if you wanted to understand how the plumbing works, we're talking to the right guy, and I'll talk to you afterwards. All right, hey everyone. My name's Jared Parsons. I'm the c -sharp compiler dev lead, as well as a member of the c -sharp language design team. And here, we're, we're here today to talk about let's design a language feature. And what we want to do in this session is kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and show you kind of how the language design process works. How do we start from a problem and an idea and get through all the tools to a shipping feature that we deliver as a part of the .NET and C Sharp releases? And what we're in this session is we're going to be using an example of a feature we shipped in C Sharp 11 to kind of take the process, and that is file local types. Now, all ideas start with a problem. And in this particular case, the problem came from our source generators teams. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, source generators are a way that the library authors plug into the compilation process. They can look at the code you're writing and use it to generate code to augment your application. They can add new functionality, they can add optimizations by moving stuff that used to be done at runtime into the compile time part of the process. Um, and we're shipping a lot of generators with .NET 7. We have like the JSON generator, the library interop generator, and like what we're going to be looking at here today is the regex generator. Now, what the regex generator does is normally when you have a regular expression in .NET, um, at runtime, that expression has to be parsed. They have to generate all the code to do the matching at runtime. That can impact things like they can limit your optimization opportunities. But now in .NET 7, we to, at compile time, do all of that work. And you can see here that I have this nice little partial method called get email regex. I have this attribute generate, which tells the regex generator, hey, Here's a regex that I want you to, to process at compile time. A nice little go to definition here. And we can look at what this generator is doing. It's taking that, it's processing it, and it's generating all this beautiful code here, nicely commented, that's actually processing that regex. And it did that all at compile time instead of at runtime. Significant performance wins for our applications. The regex, the generator authors came to us because they found a bit of a problem with this approach. Because in order to do a lot of their generation, they have to generate these helper types, like you'll see here, this derivation of regex, get email regex zero. Um, and they said, this is a bit of a problem. We really want these type presentation details of our generators. We don't want users depending on them, because this is something we want to 
evolve over time in making the scenarios better. But unfortunately, it's a part of the compilation and users can see it. The off is that when users are typing, IntelliSense actually shows it to them. It starts leading them down that, telling them, hey, this is a type that you should use. Look at all these cool take dependencies on them. And this is something they worry would inhibit their ability to evolve these generators in the future. And also, another problem. What happens if the user defines the exact same name type that they want to generate in their code? Well, that means that their code stop, their generated code stops working. And in order to solve this problem, they have to complicate their generation process, they have to start scanning the comp compilation, looking for any types of that name, and making sure they don't have conflicts. And overall, they felt like that this, this made the generator scenario a bit more fragile, a bit more incomplete. And they were looking for the solvent. But they also had an idea. They came to us and said, listen, why don't you let us write private in front of these top levels? And the effect we would have there is make that type local to this file. It doesn't conflict with types and other files and other people can't see it. And so, and this is where kind of the we have a problem. presentation was, was going to talk. This is just one word that really lead to the design is the text that we have to look at. And one of the first questions we start asking ourselves is, is this word going to stand? For example, right now, the idea is just how can we type to a file, but a lot of way you could extend this feature in the future is making it and properties and making them to a file. In private, it's not going to It's not going to work. The next thing we talked about is what take two existing modifiers, slam them together, and let's create a new one. Use private internal. And this may seem silly, but we've done before. A few releases ago, protected to express a new form of accessibility. And it was a very successful feature. Um, but it is a bit wordy. It doesn't really ring trying to get here. It doesn't really scream to a file. So the next thing we talked about is maybe we just use modify private. We say, hey, private was a good idea, but let's give it a little more meaning by saying file private. And this is going to resonate with customer. This reads really, really well. And people are going to kind of get an intuitive understanding of this by looking at it. It's also a bit wordy, though. It is using two words. We felt like one word might be enough. And so eventually, we kind of said, let's just use file. File is nice. It's descriptive. It's simple. And it's extend to other scenarios in the future should we want it to. And after a lot of discussion, this is where we came out with. This resonated the most with the language design team, the generator authors, as well as the various community members we talked to. And I've made this process a little bit silly, talking about the ways we deal with words. But the look and feel of C Sharp is incredibly important. And we spend a lot of time talking about it, rat holing, and going back and forth on the ideas. And we spend a significant amount of time on even little tiny problems like this. But the next thing we do, and we did in this case, is we said, hey, what, have any other languages done this before? Because if other languages have solved this problem, we can look to them for inspiration. We can see what went well with their implementation. How do customers use this feature in their ecosystem? And how, what can we learn from to make our feature better? And when we looked around, we found lots of examples of languages that do this. For example, F has a concept of and implementation files, very, very similar to header files in C++. But they have this really nice property. Only things that exist in the signature file are visible to other parts of the program. If you have a type that is only in a file, it is limited to file. It's almost exactly built here. It has more ceremony involved, but it has six properties we're going for. And this is a very successful feature in F Sharp. It's used in lots of um, lots of programs to wild. Like Golang. Golang has a similar concept.
Така, мисля, че може да почнем. Добре дошли, макар че може би повечето хора са онлайн. Това е ивента, който ние организираме като хостиве на .NET Conf. И аз съм поканил Радия Танасов, който е най-как да кажа, дългогодишните контрибютори в нашото комьюнити в технологиите на Microsoft и а, Иван Боаевски, който също е един от дългогодишните контрибютори с много а, сериозен опит в а, различни технологии, но също така и в Microsoft технологии. И двамата са с, може би, поне 20 години. Иван, аз го знам от повече от 20 години, нали? Като човек, който се занимава с а, технологии, свързани с а, а, това, което развива Microsoft. Радия Танасов може би е по-добре сам да се представи. А, той беше един от примерите за човек от нашето комьюнити, който се е развил в областта на, сега се нарича Modern Workspace, SharePoint и а, е признат лектор на много конференции. И а, аз не знам, може би Иван е ти може да кажеш също някакви неща, понеже ти правиш толкова работи, че мен е трудно да ще за малко време. Ами, да, за всички тия години минах през почти всичко, което Microsoft пускаше и изпробвах всички мои неща. Сега наистина е интересно какво ще изглежда от Бог на цели. Така, ами а, сега точно е момента да коментираме, понеже конференцията започна вчера, продължава днес, само част от лекциите са публикувани от първия ден, има анонси с новостите, но все още не всичко е налично като видеоматериал. И основният фокус е върху перформанс, върху подобрената производителност, която ние очакваме в различните видове приложения около Дотнет. Реално. Така, в контекста на това, може би а, е хубаво да започнем с а, това какво, какво вие мислите като а, най-интересно в, в а, точно този отклад. Където имаме ние подобрения на производителността, няма значение дали е свързано с веб приложения или някакви по-генерални други оптимизации. Ради? Добре. А, къде е най-интересно? Да, според теб. Ами от перформанс гледна точка, наистина слайдовете още от първите, които ще дадем на конференция, бяха много така динамични, с по хикс пъти и повишения. Сега най-интересното е, може би, трудно да кажа. Това, което за мен и за работа вършиме, е нещата свързани около System Text, JSON, подобрените, сепризирането, те сепризирането, както и довеждането на полимофични типове по време на сепризация и десепризация. Това е нещо, което в наши проекти и наши колеги са правили нали, сами. Много да обясниш на хората, понеже от тези, да. които ни слушат онлайн, може, може и някой да не знае точно дали. Значи, Полиморфични обекти са такива обекти, които имат са различни притежания. Съответно, да се сериализира и десериализира, традиционно ние трябва да дадем твърд тип, на, на, които обръщат класове и от класове към JSON. И съответно, полиморфични означава, че може да си моделираме типовете, както са в бизнес полиморфичните ни, и а, да ги изпращаме в JSON формат чрез дискриминатори, евентуално да да детерминираме към какъв твърд тип може да обърнем съответния JSON обект, защото той обикновено не си казва към какъв тип искаме да го се разяде, но не, не трябва да обслужваме този Често в практиката се случва да направим един клас с 20 пропатита, от които да ползваме само 6. И да имаме абсолютно ненужни операции по време на фанш. В нашата работа това е приложимо. И а, факта, че го има в доп. 7, означава, че сега трябва да махнем една комара код, да правим нещо и да използваме нея. 
А, това е интересно, наистина. А, Иване, ти какво мислиш? Аз а, се впечатлих от перформанс ускорен за линк. Ставаше дума за 45 и висока скорост. Много се зачудих, защото то принципно малко се различаваше от а, това сам да си напишеш кода. И 45 пъти означава, че са постигнали скорост, която е по-висока от това, което може да си напишеш като работа. Оказва се, че всъщност това, което са имплементирали, са хардуер методи, които разбира се са активни само когато са съответната сега позволя. Но според това, което представиха, имат и доста подобрения за ам машините което прави доста, доста интересно вече на работата в тази посока. Това е възможно. Да. Сега да беше и възможно да е чест се и вижда с това вече. Точно така. Реално това беше доста специфично, че когато използваме разни ламда изрази, перформанса не беше впечатляващ. И сега не да се получават доста, доста по-добре, но а, реално ще видим в а, проекти, които са предъчен, понеже а, до сега нещата бяха а, в превю и превю. Повечето компании не искат да избързват с имплементация от релиз а, на фреймърците, които са още в превю. Аз не знам от хората, които са тук при нас, дали, дали искате да дадете някакъв дар, по отношение на нещата, които почнаха да се публикуват около новия сон на Excel и другите подобрения, ако кажа. Всем момента. Чакаме. Тук не пък на сайт на Hardware Intrinsics. Две версии чакаха на дело с поръки, че ще ви се позабавят. И то сериозно ще ви се обърди. Ти ускорения са хубави на теория, ще видим на практика как се случва. В смисъл, са пърфик, защото дори не са истински психологи. Много голяма част от всичките сичери, които са говорили за вас, са съвсем с симпатични шуга, които неща. Така, да, 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 много ме се гледа, че стигам толкова обясняваше за колко перформанси имат регулар изпрещен от една. Кой се занимава с перформанси и колко регулар изпрещен от една? Ми се отдавна много гол за всеки, който иска перформанси. Давам пример бе така, като в стаклова работа да си направя с компасър, за да се не повторя да ги. Тът се гъзняха, в смисъл. И всички чакаме, смисъл всички. Чакаме от две години, чакаме юлин типове, грин трекове, някакви такива обещания на сега. Получаваме само много много такива. И вече е една, но ще се... В това отношение, но... Нека да го свърдим също така с някои други фреймърци, където по-трудно се правя на изменения съответно в стандартите. А, въпреки, че Microsoft и основен контрибютор все пак те направиха а, а, много по-добър контрибюшън, сега нали, не е всичко черна кутия. И от тази гледна точка а нещата малко малко че е Microsoft JSON. Вместо да си четвам, те си взеха в Microsoft да се направи си го си набиха там. За четне такво и смисъл един open source, който е просто умряващо от държавна версия. Систем Tech JSON, който на всичко отгоре от първите си версии даже не беше по-стрелян. В смисъл не беше съвнести, в смисъл не беше, не нямаше достатъчно фичери и различни дефолти. И различни дефолти. Да, 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 да
Да. Ама за сюжет, ако ти Добре, а какво мислите за нещата, които правят с Blazer и сега има хибридно приложение с Blazer? И малко е мъртво модема, примерно. Те го направиха, те направиха на екипа. Мисля, екипа е поредния Windows Mobile, които са 14 човек и се мъчат да направят нещо да цел след да ползвам, а всъщност не стига бюджета. Виждам, че сега вече след седма песа, след като го пускаме някакъв път и си има някакъв ентусиазъм, виждам, че са се позасилили малко, като вече му добавят техни си контролите, защото това са с контролите по този бизнес в момента. Поти вече контролите не съществуват, джавски фреймовете вече са космически и използват технологии, мисля, не технологии, използват ноу-хау, което не е всичко правим с C-Sharp и C-Sharp е супер, че направим UI с C-Sharp и не си не се получи. Ще направим само юзер интерфейс да бъде с дати, дата за нищо друго не мога да ползвам и въпреки това е бъде. Няма обяснение за това, но всяко не е обяснение. Мислите ли, че причина за успеха на една технология е само техническото решение или може да мисля доста комплексно неща? Всичко е важно. Значи и на една. Преди много години сън направиха джаба и направиха популярна с маркетинг от между 9 милиарда. Забравяме джаба сега. Да, това имах предвид, че някои неща като решения може би са били правилни технически. А дали комьюнитито приема тези неща, дали компаниите и бизнеса приемат тези неща, е нещо, което зависи от много други фактори. Абсолютно. Майко се оставят с това отношение. То много. Аз съм че бурък с много хора, които казват, че сме случили някакъв да ми снова във факт, да напишем на колко ще бъдат с това. И се отличи неща. Писали сме на всички такова, не перформанс е никога от тези. Перформанс е никога от хората. Дълго време езикът беше възм с една съпротивна система и всички избягаха на една другата. Всички, които са в момента пълно с биетите, професорите, които са върваме на начало, когато не е по-добрави. Така, приемаме да ви коментирам, като нарасне, то обикновено настройства и негативен баланс към него. За това питон Swift, те просто казват, че чакаме на първата. Чакаме сега с НТП, да видим Майкъл Сот, дали ще зачакваме, ще направим. Да видим нещата, да го ви хареса. Разбрахме, нали, някои неща. Супер е, смисъл супер е. Просто сега тая версия, по-скоро си чува да го правим. Премиалната версия беше нещо много по-впечатляща като фича се. Да, миналата година изгледнаха много нови функционално фокусе върху перформанс. И това и да, да се и как да кажа, максимизира качество, да се фиксат някакви неща и така на те. И мало и тръпно и много сега в себе. И мало тръпно и много сега в себе. От 6 до 7 много добре. Това са проекта. Бейзър също е много добро. Аз си бъдам чисто. Бейзър е малко ябщо там да се зададе. Бейзър е тъпно, че чакаме да го служат мулти трени. Тогава ще бъде истинско предимство да пишеш на Бейзър пред това. Да, да, да. Всички 
хора, които познавам по пишната, не са свикнали да стават. Да, с на Microsoft разбира няколко мултиплатформа или фреймворка. А, кой вие така бихте нарочили като най-интересен, понеже мал и е единия на лице. Съвмени с всичко останало, това е стрето един вече не прави курс, отказва да пише приложение, отказва да се напише тези приложения. Microsoft се пише приложения на правилно за птица, кое приложение на практика. Така че аз предпочитам те за това, за това вече е много добра писалност. Аз предпочитам нещо, което пише и другото. Там да пише. И се учим да прави всичко. Аз не съм го спрази. Едно а, друго видео, което е свързано с един друг, а, пак така, мултиплатформен фреймворк. Не знам дали сте го виждали, но предлагам да направим а, едно включване за малко, да видите това нещо. me here today. In this session we're going to have a look at why a growing number of businesses and developers are picking Avalonia UI as their preferred cross-platform technology when building apps with .NET. So I have to consider that the session title is a little clickbaity. However, if you disagree or you agree, I do hope that you'll stick around to discover why I think that Avalonia genuinely is the best .NET framework for building platform applications. So let's start from the very basics. 
what is Avalonia UI? Well, it's a cross-platform UI framework that enables developers to build apps for Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, Android, and the web using C Sharp and XAML, all from a single .NET standard library. So one project, all of those frameworks. And it's been developed for almost a decade with contributors from all over the globe. And it's part of the .NET Foundation, in fact, the third most active project within the .NET Foundation. So it's pretty popular and it's been around for a while. Now you may not have heard of it, but you may know of other technologies that sound similar, like .NET MAUI or XAML Forms. And you're wondering, well, how is Avalonia UI different? And that's a great question. So we're different because we enable developers to build pixel perfect apps and support the broadest of platforms by not depending on or abstracting the underlying operating system UI toolkit. So I think this is best explained if we have a look at the general architect of Avalonia UI. So if we look at the bottom, you'll see the iRendering platform. And connected to this, we have Direct 2D and Skia. Now this is how we push pixels to the screen. So we're predominantly using Skia. You can use Direct 2D, but most, most of our developers aren't. So we use Skia to draw the contents of your application. So we can create pixel perfect apps that we only have to write once, and they're gonna look the same across all of the devices that we support. And we're in good company with this approach because this is the same approach that used that's used by other popular UI frameworks like Flutter. And it allows us to develop a product because we're not having to rewrite that control or custom controls for each platform using platform specific APIs. We write it once and it works the same everywhere. It also allows us to reduce support costs because we don't need to write documentation that's unique to every platform where things look different or centers don't need multiple different scripts depending on what platform the, the user is using. We can deliver a consistent user experience regardless of the So in terms of how our apps look, we have complete control over that. By default, controls within Avalonia don't have any styles. You have to add a theme in order to get the controls to, to look like anything. So we call these lookless controls. Um, we ship themes uh, within Avalonia. So the, the most popular one to use is the Fluent Design Inspired theme, which is perfect for, for creating modern looking desktop applications for Windows. But there's also themes from our community, including the Material Design Inspired theme, which is perfect for if you want to create uh, an Android, for example. So we're different in the sense that everything on the screen is rendered by Avalonia. There's no native UI controls. What else are we different? Well, less so of a differentiator with MAUI or Xamarin Forms, which is also designed to be cross-platform. Um, there are technologies out there that are similar that allow you to run .NET code across a uh, number of platforms, but the API isn't designed to be, be cross-platform. Decided very early when we were building Avalonia that all of the APIs and all of the features that we add need to make sense of a cross-platform UI framework. We're heavily inspired by WPF, but we're not copying WPF because to copy WPF or WinUI for that matter, doesn't really make sense when you think about the broad range of platforms that we want to support. It doesn't make sense to use WinUI APIs in a web browser or on an iPhone. If we took this approach, we would effectively be playing catch up to what the folks in Redmond are creating. We'd lose control over the future and what APIs we could implement. And when those features that Redmond implement make sense for the supported platform, we would be forced into a situation where we need to throw thousands of not implemented exceptions. And that's just going to deliver a terrible experience for everyone. So we 
design our APIs from the initial concept uh, through to delivery to be cross-platform. How else are we different? Well, we're really lightweight. You saw the overview of the architecture and all the little individual bits of the, the puzzle. There's not much to it. We just have one implementation that works the same across all of the platforms. There aren't too many moving parts and we're very lightweight. I think one of the areas that you can see this light, just how lightweight we are is assembly and Linux. So we'll start with WebAssembly. Now this is a little sample app that we've been working on to, to show off XAML uh, in, in, in the browser. So this is the full .NET 7 runtime and Avalonia with no trimming. So we haven't tried to you know, reduce the size of this. Um, it comes in at 7.6 megs. So it's not small, well, it's not tiny, but it's not massive either. And it allows us to write C sharp and XAML in the browser and see that live. Um, so why don't I show you that to you? So here I am in my browser. I'm going to head over to avaloniaui.net. I'm going to hover over developers, come to WASM Playground. And this app works the same no matter what platform we're on. It hasn't been built specifically for the browser. This works and it's the same code that runs on the desktop or on an iPad. Um, we have the ability to edit our XAML here. We can toggle and with controls. Um, we can load local XAML files, save snippets. We can bring in snippets from GitHub. And we can explore different controls. So let's uh, do a combo box. sliders. We'll say none of this is unique for the browser, it's just is running in the browser. And that's that's what I like about this approach is that I'm not having to to customize my application to get it running on all of these different platforms. And one little cool thing of this is that we have old but we also have some code behind it. So this is why we've got the full .NET runtime in there as well. Let's call it uh, you click me. And then when I click, you click me. And if I switch back to XAML, I can change some of these properties. Background equals red foreground equals white. You see that live update. So this is pretty neat and this is just under 8 megs uh, .NET 7 runtime live in the browser. So if you want to try out Avalonia UI this is a pretty great way to, to just explore it and get started. On the other end of the spectrum, where we did actually want to kind of shrink things down and make the app as small as possible, we have the calculator uh, demo, which is available at calc.xaml.live. And it comes in at 3.6 megs. Now there, there is an additional 0.5 megs that we could strip away um, to make this really lean. Uh, we would need to work to remove some unused bits of libskeer uh, to do that. But we thought that 3.6 megs is pretty good. We're happy with that, especially when we look at competing .NET cross-platform tech that has a calculator demo that comes in at a whopping 11.4 megs, which is three times as large. In fact, it's larger than our full playground. So 3.6 megs, we're very happy with. And we're building apps for the web. Lines really don't matter. Um, we want our binaries to be as small as possible. Um, so we're, we're pretty pleased with this. With the theme of lightweight, let's have a let's have a look at Linux. So if we come back to the architecture, um, you'll see that our Linux support only relies on X11. So we don't have any dependency on GDK, and this means that we don't need to install a full desktop environment to run your apps on Linux, which makes Avalonia UI perfect building applications for an embedded situation. 
Um, it's, a, it's a really lightweight approach. In fact, we can we can get away with just installing the Linux kernel and then outputting via the frame buffer. It really is low level um, and very minimal installations. There's not there's not any bloat to run your Avalonia app, making it perfect for low powered embedded devices. Now I have a video here one of our community members sent in. Now obviously it's not a low power device, um, but I want to show you just how fast uh, the Linux apps are to launch. Here is the app launch, and there we go, it's already and available to use. Pretty fast. Um, we've got a huge community of developers built for Embedded. Um, these are a couple of pictures of the projects that they're working on. Um, if you're interested in the development with Avalonia, there's a Telegram chat that I highly recommend you join because there's a lot of conversation about different boards that uh, are good to be using and advice for getting things configured. And lastly, on the subject of Linux, I want to show you a neat little project that one of our community members is working on, which is he's integrated a Raspberry Pi with a Macintosh Classic, and this is him actually building his Avalonia app on the Pi that's inside the old Mac. Um, so this is this is incredible. I absolutely love what he's doing here, and uh, I, I hope he shares more of this. I've seen some examples of Avalonia UI being used there, but who else is using it and what are they building? So here's a collection of logos from businesses that are currently developing apps or have shipped apps with Avalonia. And we'll, we'll take a look at a couple of these. So let's start with JetBrains. Brains have been bringing some of their WTF apps over to Avalonia in order to, to support more platforms. So Dot Memory is an example of that, where Dot Memory is now integrated into Rider, and those views are Avalonia. So Avalonia is embedded within uh, JetBrains Rider. And this is pretty common. Um, the what we see is a lot of established businesses got these WPF projects, and they they're looking at ways to modernize and support a broader range of platforms. And Avalonia UI excels at this. Uh, here's another project. Um, this is Grit Genie by Grit World. It's a digital engine uh, for filmmakers with a fully customizable rendering pipeline. It's a pretty complex application. And then another example app, and this started off uh, as a WPF app that was ported uh, to Avalonia, is uh, Lunacy by Icons 8. So this is now available to run on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. They were able to reuse a huge amount of their existing code uh, when they were targeting these new platforms. And it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a free app, so you can download that from Icons 8. So you've seen what some of the apps look like, but what does the development experience look like? Well, if you've ever built XAML, be it WPF, WinUI, or XAML in Forms, or MAUI, you're already an expert in Avalonia. It works the same way that building a WPF or WinUI app does. You have your tools, Visual Studio or Rider, um, and you write some XAML and some C Sharp. Now we do ship some extensions, um, so we have extensions for video and rider that give you a live previewer of the XAML. So on the left hand side, you can be writing on the right hand side, you see the change as writing those, uh, those snippets and changing and making modifications. We also have, come, not sure when, but coming soon, extensions for Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio Mac. The idea is that you should bring your favorite tools and and we will meet you where you are. Now I want to show you what the development experience is like. I'm going to go over to Parallels, and this is, is Windows ARM with Visual Studio uh, uh, on ARM, so it's a boot. But I have the Avalonia extension installed here, and I'm going to go ahead and create a new MVVM project, and I'll call it Hello. Dot net comp. 
and it's created the solution for me and the project. And inside of here, I have view models and I have my views. Pretty basic stuff if you've ever done the MVVM development before. And build the project. And then if I pop over to the XAML snippet, the, the main window, once we've built the designer, should load for us, or the previewer, I should say. There we go. Welcome to Avalonia. And that is coming from this greeting binding here. Let me format the XAML, um, which comes from the data context for this window, uh, which is this main window view model. So if we come over to the main window view model, we can see the text is here. Um, we're inheriting from view model base. Let's navigate to there and that's inheriting from object which we can see is what's implementing the iProperty changed interface. Now I happen to prefer to use the community toolkit because I'm terrible at programming. I, I just don't think I'm clever enough to understand that model. Uh, so let's do community toolkit. Where are we? There it is. That puppy there. Now I'm going to pop back to the view model base. Let's get rid of that. Change that to observable object. Perfect. Now I need to come into here. We can get rid of this. We can get rid of this. And there is a small bug with Avalonia running on uh, ARM for Windows, just for Windows, um, which I need to just do a quick workaround for. Uh, there we go. Equals false. Good. You won't need to do that. We're going to fix that uh, with the next version. But it's just a problem with Windows on ARM at the moment. So now that I've done that, we should be able to rebuild this. Oh yeah, that's already built, that was super quick. I'm gonna do partial and we're gonna remove this. Let's do private string, we'll call it title and we're gonna add the, the uh, observability, observable property. I'm gonna hit build so that the solar races can do their thing. The main window view model. So we'll add the constructor. And here we can now do title equals hello.net comp. So that's just, I mean, this is vanilla uh, community toolkit MVVM stuff. Um, but I just wanted to show that it this all just works how you would expect it to. So there we go, hello.net comp. Um, I can run this. There we go. Lovely. So it's inspired by, but not a clone of WPF. So I want to show you some snippets that make this really, really obvious just how similar we are. This is a snippet of XAML that defines a window with a button in it. To make this an Avalonia snippet, all we need to change is the XAML namespace and now it's available to use uh, in Avalonia. The, there is, and I think the biggest difference is relating to styles. Our styles kind of take an approach of a mix of CSS and UWP and WP. Um, so I would recommend if you have experience with other technologies, XAML technologies, um, Come on over to add dot. All of the information you need to be able to get started, um, and it goes quite in depth. If you have built WPF apps and you're on, wanting to kind of get to the point of what are the key differences, scroll to the bottom of the list on the left, and there is a whole section dedicated for explaining the key differences in fix for WPF developers. So let's have a look at what's well the 
the biggest new thing is Avalonia version 11. Now, why version 11? If we look at the previous version or the current stable version, it's 0.10.18. And this zero based versioning scheme, it led to some doubt from developers about the maturity and stability of, of the framework. They were kind of dismissive of Avalonia because it hadn't even reached version one. But truth be told, it's been developed for almost a decade by those hundred contributors. It's used in Fortune 500. It's tried and tested. It's a mature enable framework and the zero versioning scheme didn't reflect the reality of the stability. Um, so we decided with the next version, which is version 11, that we would adjust how we were numbering the, the framework in order to reflect fairer on the reality of its stability. So we are now jumping from 0.10 to 11. So we're dialing it up to 11 as something. And we actually created a little video to demonstrate some of the, the features and to announce the, uh, the early previews. So that was uh, the announcement video for V11. Um, it's, V11 is packed full of new features. So we have the new compositional renderer, which is a huge, huge achievement for us. Um, I'm not sure why that's a big deal. I highly recommend reading the documentation, the WinUI compositional renderer, and why that's so uh, such a vast improvement over the rendering of a WPF app, for example. Um, we have rich text editing, Apple templates, we have new platforms with iOS, Android, web, we have Wayland support coming, the apps are faster, the binary sizes are smaller, there's less allocations, which uh, improves gut collections because there's fewer collections required. It's just, it's, it's packed full of so many new features. And one of the, uh, the community members, in fact, the, the guy that created the, the Mac that's running with the Raspberry Pi, we created a little demo app uh, in just an afternoon to demonstrate just how buttery smooth the new compositional renderer is. So you can see some of the animations here. And hopefully we'll release this as open source so that you can download this and check out the code. Now what we do have for the download is for V11 right now is our Wordalonia. Uh, demo app and this is uh, like well but running across all of the different platforms that we support so here's a little demo of that so this is in the browser and it's 100 percent same code across all of these platforms so this is desktop mac uh, this is iphone and then lastly we've got android there so you can grab that uh, from our github today and start playing with it and exploring uh, version 11. Uh, there's preview 3 out already, so do check that out. What else do we have? Well, we have some, some something I'm very excited to share with you today. Um, this may come as a Така, и вече с лайф отново с последните неща, които бих искал а, да коментираме, поне за днеска в този кратък стриминг. И това, което исках да ви помоля 
да споделите кои са функционалностите, които очакваме. Тук имаме на присъединил се към нас а, а, специалист, съответно ще коментира. Можеш да се представиш? Ами, така се Кирил Кимаков и аз съм от старата школа вече 20 години. Съм от Дотнет екосистемата. Да, горе съм. Ами, добре, да започнем тогава с теб, всъщност какво очакваш от а, а, .NET и от C-Sharp в бъдещите версии. Това, което като тенденция, това, което очаквам, е Дотнета да заживее истински а, живот като а, екосистема за разпределени системи. В смисъл, това, което се случва в Ажур, ми дава така, основание да си мисля, че има, има бъдеще на истински разпределени системи, микросервизи и прочее. Са, са, още да се правят микросервизи, още по-лесно е да се правят API, допълнити, без да се налагат емисии, при сложните операции и други прочие такива неща. Това нещо да създаваш разпределени е нещо, което е търпно случатам. Чакаме с нетърпение Орлин 7. И да, има език, има език, има а, малко, но пък а, али, обещаващи а, разширения, които коментирах за, за статичните, а, статичните абстрактни, абстрактни методи. Това нещо ще позволи много поколени се за цените. Очаквам да видим как ще е екосистемата, open source екосистемата, как ще похване. Чудесно, Мерси. Това е наистина едно доста така а, очаквано мисля, доста знателно от много хора, а, развитие на платформата. Ради ти какво мислиш по въпроса? Какво очаквам? Ами след седа и от седа? След седа, да кажем. А, значи за начало по-добри инструменти за разработка. Нещо започвам да виждам как Visual Studio губи аудитория за сметка на конкуренти, като Rider на JetBrains. Аз също имам много боля на създаден от Visual Studio. Съответно, там, там бобата е жестока, понеже е много така, софтуерна възраст с тежко минало, с компетбилите с Хората са страшно много неща. Сега имам 64 версии, т.е. може да ползвам Visual Studio на сърфесите си. Нали? А, но там очаквам стабилност. Почва от колкото фичери. Форма стопимизация и стабилност. А, защото не искам да се разправя с Visual Studio, искам да се разправя с Corel. Това е едно от нещата. Разбира се всичко, що е стабилност в Tobnet. И в компилатора, и в runtime, и в страничните библиотеки там са пълни с българ. Ако гледаш в централата на Microsoft, работа има над 40 000 българа и така нататък. И а, съответно стабилност е много важно нещо. Аз мога да ви да? съм. Преди, преди няколко години, не, не, не много, Линус Торабов беше казал, има смисъл да компилираме с ARM, само когато нашите машини, на които работим с ARM. И това, че вече има Visual Studio с ARM, може да произвеждаме с софтуер, който да се компилира с ARM и да се отпусне в облака на ARM. Според мен е, нали, прави, прави смисъл, това ще направи платформата по-стабилност. Смисъл ще даде положителна насока на това да се развива една, една, една ARM екосистема, отколкото просто да си просто правила. Плюс има дали актуални хардуер на ARM, които се стават за дебелно отношение. Да, да, да. 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 Да.
Ами аз това очаквам. Всъщност аз го бях подготвил като въпрос, който дискутираме, но ще го кажа като излът на нали? Тъй като продуктите, с които работим, нещата, които правим, нали? са сериозни консуматори на клад ресурси. Така да се каже на нашите клиенти, сметките им за ежедневно ресурсите са огромни. Ако всичките тия перформанси дадат реално издържение в едно намаляване на на сметката и крайната в клауда, това би било страхотно и това е нещо, което според мен е очаквано да видя в момента при прехода към тази версия. Аз имам един друг, може би последен такъв въпрос. Как мислите, че е добре да се развие платформата, за да стане по-популярна сред младите хора, които сега има много визици вече, нали, конкуренцията е голяма, Излизат нови неща, нови платформи, нови езици. Ние сме правили такова. Ами, вие сте стари ползватели. Аз и винаги със сигурност. За мен е това, което Microsoft каза в 2014-2015, ще направим нов топнет. Развиваме да работим на всичко, да върши работа за всичко. Нека полека започва да става истина, защото в момента топнет е последната. Може да правиш всичко на нея. Докато ако си Angular програмист, може да правиш Angular неща в браузера и там живееш. Да? И докато си React програмист, плюс-минус на някои други изчадени на технологиите, React може да правиш в браузера и, а, и в днешно време, даже днес имах един случай на нея, колежка казва, разглеждам Java и мисля. И моето първо усещане беше на един топнат, ако стане да толкова се разви, че можеш с едни познания да правиш всичко. Тоест, в днешно време е специалист, може да прави веб, може да прави UI, може да прави игри, да, може да прави клауд технология, може да прави какво не е още. IoT. Всякакви неща и наистина топнат 7 постига това нещо. Плюс-минус някакви неща, не може да пишем тестове, не може да бенчмарк тестове да правим. А... Да. Добре. Блейзера има потенциал да върви на Лази, който е сервер за да. Лазан. Да. Което е още една миша, да е Да, т.е. с Блейзер отваря много такива интересни технологични решения на проблеми. Аз бих добавил, че точно ние сме хората, които сме отговорни за създаването на знанието, интереса към новото поколение. Защото ако има този е, вътрешен бунтарски дух, не е аз отново, не е аз ще правя нещо друго. Е, и това е в много случаи много пагубно. Виждаме как се появяват старите и умират, защото са избрали подходящата технология, в която да стъпят. Това е много интересно всъщност. Точно неподходяща технология за стартъпи е едно добро основание на много хора да им кажа, да върнете внимание на това, което правим от години, защото то всяка година излиза нова версия е все по-добро и по-добро. И са все по-очакивани. Добре, това са интересни а, точки за дискусия. Ние се надяваме по-често да имаме такива събития, понеже вече и имаме възможност да се събираме а, и като юзер групи, и като автор ивенти, и по ивенти, и да правиме повече панели, където всъщност а, да дискутираме някакви проблеми. Не просто да имаме пасив learning, където определен човек изнася неговото виждане за решаване на някакъв проблем, а можем да имаме и дискусии, които повече хора тези дискусии и добри идеи. Ами, благодаря ви тогава много за участието. Много се радвам, че успяхме да направим това събитие за първи път в новия а, обновен, да кажем, офис на Microsoft с втория Dream Space в а, цялата структура на компанията от света. И се надяваме да можем отново благодарение на а, хората, които ни съдействаха, като Ашев. Благодаря ти да дойдем тук за някои други събития. И...
Благодаря на които дойдоха и ни гледаха онлайн и мога да ви поканя в събота на JS Talks. За JST имаме други дискусии около JavaScript и веб-технологиите, но много от казусите са подобни. Така че нека да се видим тогава и да О, да, ще има и готини а, неща, готини подаръци от страна на Microsoft, готини фанелки. А, ще има челлендж, клауд челлендж от съответно а, Microsoft, който ние ще обявиме сега. Този клауд челлендж е свързан с задача, която се прави с Microsoft Azure. И на 24 ноември ние ще имаме друго събитие по случай релиза на SQL Server 2022. И тогава се надявам пак да се съберем, ще поканим някои от хората, които са много дип в кор SQL нещата. Ще дискутираме тези неща и ще обявим печелившите от Cloud Challenge, който ще анонсираме тази седмица с Microsoft. Благодаря ви още веднъж. Да, и една секунда.